three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. All right, welcome to Roots of Reality. I'm your host, Ben Bauman, and today I'm going to be talking about the history of rejecting science. So historically, science has always been a subject under attack, often because while science is based on what is most likely to be true in regard to the best objective evidence available, what is scientifically true isn't necessarily good for business. And as a result, often... It gets in the way of those trying to make money off of pseudoscience, like oil companies, for example, that for decades have lobbied government officials to reject climate change. Alternatively, though, another reason science is often under attack is because scientific literacy is often very low in societies around the world in general. As a result, if a person comes across a scientific concept that they don't understand, they usually will just probably ignore it and not care. But once a scientific subject gets politicized, then they will often look for the lazy answer, which often requires no attempt to actually understand the complexity of a scientific issue, but instead look for that quick fix solution that makes everything easy to understand, like the idea that experts or the government are just trying to scam us based on some conspiracy theory. And then on social media, these people may refer to themselves as not a conspiracy theorist, but a conspiracy realist, because they claim to see beyond the smoke and mirrors of the world. And this idea empowers these people and gives them a sense of control in the world. This is especially true for those who never studied science in college, given K-12 education often does a pretty poor job of providing basic scientific literacy for the population as well. And on top of this, There's also just this general animosity towards the academic community, which plays a role in driving pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. Because if a person never went to college or while in college never studied science, then when you're looking at a complex scientific subject and finding it hard to understand, this then kind of makes the science inaccessible to a person who never had a ton of interest in it or never studied it. And what can be really dangerous then is if someone then starts all of a sudden taking an interest in a scientific subject after it's become politicized, then a person will see all these academic scholars as these corrupt elitists trying to make money off of scamming them. And it's actually a benefit that they didn't go to college and never studied science in college because this serves as an excuse for themselves to then do their own research where they can do research that's not corrupted by the elite. And so instead of listening to experts that have oftentimes come from all sorts of different socioeconomic backgrounds and cultures who've dedicated their lives to a subject, often with little media attention, are all now hopelessly corrupt individuals in the eyes of of some person that never studied the subject until it became politically popular. And for then, these people who become obsessed with this crusade against science, they will then become social media influencers or independent researchers or documentary producers or authors who promote pseudoscience. An example of this crazy type of thinking comes from the documentary The Principle, which promotes the false idea that the sun revolves around the earth instead of vice versa. Uh, This documentary came out in 2014 is just one of countless examples of terrible documentaries promoting pseudoscience. And so now after giving this brief intro into kind of the mindset of many people who reject science in the modern world, now I will share some different examples throughout history of people who rejected or attacked the scientific consensus to promote pseudoscience. Starting off in the 1800s, we have the American inventor, 
Charles Redheffer, who claimed he had created a perpetual motion machine, which he would then use to scam people out of money by charging them to view it. Luckily, though, an engineer who knew better would later come along and debunk his machine, proving it was fake. However, this hasn't stopped people throughout history claiming to have invented perpetual motion machines. In fact, George Plimpton, who is a, one of my ancestors, as I mentioned in earlier episodes, was well-known engineer in New York City in the, late, in the late 1800s, also came across people claiming to have created perpetual motion machines and tried hard to explain to them why that wasn't possible. And even today, you could still find people that talk about the idea that perpetual motion is a real thing. But of course, the government is hiding it from the world uh, to make money, um, which I always kind of kind of find amusing given the historic incompetence of government in general. So, And next, also in the 1800s, we have Daniel David Palmer, who was the creator of chiropractic medicine. He was an anti-vaxxer and a person who rejected germ theory. And instead, he promoted the idea that spinal adjustments can fix various health issues. And obviously, this is scientifically inaccurate. Unfortunately, though, the legacy of Palmer has been quite powerful over time, given chiropractic medicine, despite being based on little evidence and being potentially dangerous, has become a really mainstream practice. You can see chiropractic you know, programs at major universities across the country and you know, a lot of people just go to a chiropractor without knowing any background or history about the field and just assume it's a normal science-based part of the medical care industry. And in reality, it's not evidence-based at all. So um, pretty scary, but this is something that is pretty popular. In fact, you just go to a random person on the street and ask them if they've seen a chiropractor before, there's a good chance they have. And finally, we have the flat earth believer John Hampton, who in the 1800s debated scientist Alfred Wallace. Afterwards, Wallace deemed the whole debate a major waste of time, given he was unable to convince John Hampton that the earth was not flat. You know, shocker that someone would, who is a true believer of something, would not be convinced in a debate, since debates are oftentimes not very beneficial for converting someone to one opinion or the other. And this then brings me to another major topic of note in the modern world today, and that is should scientists debate conspiracy theorists and promoters of pseudo-intellectual ideas? And of course, the answer for me is no. Uh, many people think that, for instance, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast is a show based around seeking the truth, that's why it's one of those popular podcasts of all time. However, in reality, is a show based around the mentality of rejecting science the way that I had just described earlier. And as a result, Joe Rogan regularly brings on people with, of course, no actual scientific background in the subjects they are discussing. Because instead, the show promotes conspiracy theories. And if they do, ha and if a guest does have a background in science, it is usually irrelevant to the scientific topic being discussed, like when Elon Musk comes on to give his latest hot takes, despite having only a bachelor's degree in physics, which is hardly relevant for a conversation about vaccines. Finally, if a person does come on with a relevant background to the topics being discussed, they're usually some rogue person who doesn't represent the consensus of the science community. So either way, it doesn't really matter for the show because the show is all based around promoting pseudoscience and conspiracy theories that the show already supports. Therefore, going on the Joe Rogan experience or similar podcasts or shows to debate as an academic is really not very productive because Joe Rogan is not a non-biased host nor hosting a setting where people can objectively discuss an issue. Instead, is a place where conspiracy theorists guess and Joe Rogan would just try to make academics look bad to show viewers why so-called experts are wrong and corrupt or just wrong and delusional. 
Additionally, Joe Rogan's audience will not care at all what a scholar has to say because they are watching Joe Rogan for Joe Rogan, not whatever scholar he can convince to come on and get obliterated in the comments section by his audience on YouTube or something. And this is because you just have to understand that the vast majority of people that watch Joe Rogan are his fans who are loyal to him. And being a Joe Rogan fan is part of their identity. Thus, in some ways, like a cult, unless the star of the show, Joe Rogan, says he agrees with an expert, most of his audience will not care at all what some random scholar they don't know coming on the podcast has to say. This is just like when Bill Nye went to debate the creationist Ken Ham at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which didn't exactly go well. And so just by showing up to the Creation Museum or the Joe Rogan podcast for a debate gives these places and platforms a legitimacy they don't deserve and promotes the idea that the topic that topics like evolution in the case of the Creation Museum or vaccines in the case of the Joe Rogan experience are scientifically debatable when they are not. And that any non-expert can do their own research that isn't peer-reviewed by experts and magically know the truth. And so in turn, this is kind of like if Joe Rogan, who is known for studying mixed martial arts his entire life, goes on someone else's podcast and gets told he knows nothing about mixed martial arts and he's just some elitist working for the UFC, hiding the truth from people or is just, you know, copying what the the so-called consensus of, uh, you know, UFC and mixed martial arts experts claim is the truth about mixed martial arts as and serving just as another gatekeeper, as, as many like to say in the conspiracy theory world. And finally, one other thing I want to point out about this kind of odd situation between conspiracy theorists and academics is just how often academics get called elitists by people who reject science. Um, I think this kind of this is pretty ironic just because the vast majority of academics are not rich and certainly make way less than the rich celebrities promoting conspiracy theories like Joe Rogan or Russell Brand or Elon Musk or, of course, Donald Trump and more. So if a person is concerned about elitists in the world, sort of these rich, influential people, then maybe they shouldn't be listening to people that are the exact definition of a thing they claim to be avoiding. So overall, experts debating non-experts on platforms like these are more likely to feed the fire of pseudoscience. And in general, debates in any context are often a waste of time unless you have an undecided audience and a lack of scholarly consensus on a subject where something can be debatable. And so here we are in 2023 with the rejection of science and society continuing to be a major problem and unlikely to go away anytime soon without a better education system that teaches critical thinking, which currently we are far from. You know, you don't have to be a scientist to you know, understand basic science and be scientifically literate. Um, but you do need to kind of follow what people that dedicate their lives to the subjects are doing. Otherwise, you will be just kind of lost in the dark and fumbling around and buying into th ideas that are totally based on pseudoscience instead, which is not very beneficial if you're actually trying to truly objectively understand the world around you. And if you are a supporter of, you know, shows like the Joe Rogan Experience, you know, you could be a fan of, of a person's work, while also not believing in all the things that they believe. So when it comes to subjects like pseudoscience or pseudohistory, you know, probably best to take things that various celebrities say with a grain of salt and just try to separate that stuff from things they say that have nothing to do with you know, scholarly fields that they don't really know much about. So with that, as always, remember, billions of years led to you, so make the most of it.